do your pre-recorded class session uh, for the week of November 2nd um, through uh, the week of November 2nd and 3rd. Actually, I think it's the week of November 3rd. Um, we're doing a pre-recorded section today because um, it's uh, election day and um, it's a, now a state holiday, so the college is closed. So make sure you go out and vote if you haven't already done so, uh, if you're eligible to vote uh, in the election uh, that's happening right now today. Uh, so let's go and get started. We're just going to run through some of the problems from sections 7, 3, 8, 1, and 8, 2 uh, that my math lab uh, popped up. So here is uh, the first problem that came up. This is problem 3 from section 7.3. Um, so it says use the accompanying data table to draw a normal probability plot. Uh, determine the linear correlation between the observed values and the expected z-scores. And then determine the critical value um, in the table of critical values of correlation. So we'll look at all that here in a second. So uh, as discussed in the section 7.3 video lecture, what you want to do is you want to uh, copy and paste this information. Now there's actually more information here than you need. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So um, they're, they're giving you um, more data than you need. So the only data you actually need here is these observed values. Don't, the actual data values. So um, I don't know that there's a good way to only do that, uh, only copy that, but um, one way to do it is to copy it into a Google Sheet, which I don't have one open, so let me open one real quick. Right, we've done this kind of thing before. Um, you could copy it all right into class calc and then just only use the column you need, or you can go in here and you just get the data values you want. So the data values we want are those observed values. So now we can go into class calc, drop those into a table. Okay, and then we want to tell it to do a normal probability plot, which uh, if you don't remember what that name is to type it in, you can look under stat distribution and plot and it's this last one so then we put in the uh, where our list is our list is in x sub 1 okay and so now I can zoom in on that probability plot and you can see what it looks like to answer uh, question number one over here right which one of these looks most like that uh, and you can see it's not as straight of line as a or C uh, and it I can't see it very well here, so let me, whoa, that made it look even weirder. Um, so one thing you might want to do, um, I might have put this, oh, I see one of the things that is going on here. Um, that could be an issue for doing this problem and why you guys might have changed it, which is I've current they've currently graphed it on the y-axis, so if I click this thing here, and then zoom in, it should look more like it does. If I, I want to make sure I put it on the x-axis. Uh, and then I can make my windows match uh, what's in the graphs to see this even better. So if I go up here and I change my x-axis to go from 35 to uh, 65, and then my y-axis to go from negative 1.5 to 1.5, it's a lot easier to see uh, and to figure out which one of these graphs is actually correct. So if we actually look, it's this one uh, where the values are most spread out is the uh, correct one. So it's D for that part. Okay, and then what's the correlation? So the correlation as discussed in the video is this value right here. So 0. Point, uh, rounded three, point, uh, three decimal places is 0. 0.977. Okay, and then it wants the critical value. So the critical value is in the table, right? And you choose the critical value based on the, the sample size. So the sample size here, if we look at our data set, there are eight observations. So that's our sample size. So our sample size is eight. So we're using this value, 0 0.906. And so then that, then we can answer the question. So, um, So what we want is we want the correlation to be greater than the critical value, and then it is reasonable to conclude that the data come from a population that is approximately normal. 
So that would be letter B there. So because R is greater than the critical value, we can assume that these are approximately normal. Okay, so that was one problem in section 7.3 you had to do more than once. So let's go ahead and look at uh, another problem that popped out of this as well, which was problem number six, and let's see if we can figure out uh, any details here. Okay, so we've got our data, same as with the other ones, right? So I want to copy this to my clipboard. Let me make sure real quick it was number six. Yep, so this is problem number six. So we can uh, get rid of what we were doing here and just paste in our values. And then we can do a normal probability plot. on x sub 1 and we want to change this to the x-axis and then zoom in on it and once again it's not a great graph so I can use the values given here to change that so that we get graphs that match what's going on over here so over here our x-axis um, starts at a thousand and ends at 1600 and our y-axis goes from negative 2.5 to positive 2.5 uh, and then let's try that one more time on this because it changed it for some reason negative 2.5 to 2.5 okay and then we can see which one of these graphs most closely resembles it so it's not this one that's a fairly straight line this one doesn't have any values that go low enough, right? Because down here, uh, we're all the way down to negative 2, almost. And this one doesn't get close to negative 2. Uh, this one, it these, has these weird, uh, like, steps to it, which we don't see in our graph. So it's definitely going to be B here. Okay. So then determine the mean and sample deviation of the data. So that's just going back to um, stuff we've done uh, previously, right, in this class. So I can tell it to do uh, the mean on x of 1. Oops, except I screwed it up. And that's 1247.1. And then I can tell it to do the standard deviation. You could also do these all as one var stats, right? Do all of them at once. Uh, and then this is a sample, so I'm going to use S. So that's 101.1 decimal place, so 101.2. And then it says, using the sample mean and standard deviation obtained in Part B, estimate the population mean and population standard deviation, respective draw a graph of a normal model for the distribution of the chips. Okay, so the key is here, you just want to pick the one that matches the data we are given. So the point should be at 12.24.7. Uh, I'm sorry, not 25, 1247. So this one uh, in A, it's a little bit more than 1200, which seems about right. This one, it's a little bit more than 1400, so it's definitely not that. This one, it's a little bit less than 1200, so it's definitely not that. And this one, it uh, looks like it's around 1100, so it's not that one either. So it should be A for that. So, so far, all of this is just reviewing stuff from previous sections, right? The first, uh, we did the first part of it, which is... Um, what was in this section the rest of this was old stuff so then the last part here says using the normal model from part c find the probability that 18 um an 18 inch bag of chips selected at random contains at least 1000 chips okay so now we're just going to use normal cdf oh wait nope that's not what i want normal probability i mean normal Distribution is what I want to make with a mean of what we found in the problem. So 1247.1 and a standard deviation of 101.2. And then we want to have at least a thousand. So that's more than so a thousand. So CDF X is more than a thousand. And we get a probability of 0.9927.
Gut. Oh, except I, ra I just rounded to the wrong number of decimal places. So in 0.993. And there we go. So a lot of that was from section 7.2 uh, and 7.1, but, um, and this is, the last part is as well, right? So, but it's just connecting it to what we did in this section. So 1100 to 1300, and that probability is 0 0.626. Okay, so that's it for section uh, the problems that came up in section 7.3. So let's go ahead and move on to section 8.1. So now we're moving into chapter 8. Uh, and what we did when we moved into chapter 8 is we're starting to talk about doing similar things to what we did in chapter 7, except with a mean, with these uh, sampling distribution. So let's see. Let's do um, one or two of these together. So let's see how you guys actually did on these. Try to pick out one where you struggled. Um, so let's start with, let's just start with number 10. Let's start at the end of the assignment. Uh, except that's not going to be number 10. Oh, no, it is. Okay. Yeah, let's start with this one. So this one says, the most famous guys are in the world, Old Faithful. In Yellowstone National Park has a mean time between eruptions of 85 minutes. If the interval of time between eruptions is normally distributed with a standard deviation of 21.25 complete parts A through F. So this is similar to a problem that was in the whole, uh, in the video lecture. Let's just clear everything we've done so far out of class calc. We don't need any of this for what we're about to do. So what is the probability that ra randomly selected time interval between eruptions is longer than 96 minutes? So we know it's normally distributed, so we want to do a normal distribution with a mean of 85 and a standard deviation of 21.25. Okay, and then we can look at that graph if we want, so it looks like that. And now they want us to do probabilities on that, so that means we're going to want to use CDF. So what is the probability that randomly selected time interval is longer than 96 minutes um, so we want to be longer than 96, so 96 is less than X, and we get the probability, rounded to four decimal places, of 0 0.3024. What is the probability of the random s sample of eight time intervals between eruptions has a mean longer than 96 minutes? So now, in this case, we still want to do longer than 96 minutes, but when you start doing samples, what happens is the standard deviation changes. So the standard deviation is no longer just sigma, it's sigma divided by the square root of the sample size. So in this case, the square root of 0.8. And so now, notice this graph looks exactly the same as the first one we did, and in fact, let me just draw the first one real quick. Again, so we can see the difference. So what happens is by changing this to being a sampling mean, the chances of a sample being far away from the mean are even smaller, right? Because if you sample, if you randomly sample one, uh, let's say you randomly sample the age of one person, the chances of them being near the mean age for the population are not that great. But if I randomly slap select 20 people and find their average age, that's a lot more likely to be close to the average age of the population. So that sucks the graph in. And so that's why this orange graph is um, has is so much less spread out than the purple one we started with. So now the probability that it's um, more than 96 minutes is this value here. So that's 0 0.0716. Okay. What is the probability that it's um, of a sample of 17 time intervals? So now we just change. Uh, let me get I'm going to get rid of this graph. We just change the standard deviation to 17 divided by um, sample size of 17, which isn't graphing as well anymore, but this answer still works. So the answer is 0 0.0164. What effect does increasing the sample size have on the probability? The probability increase, uh, sorry, decreases because the variability in the sample mean 
decreases as the sample size increases. So as the samples get bigger, you get closer and closer to the actual population mean. So your um, the probability is going to go down because the variability goes down. You're less likely to be farther away from the mean. What might you conclude if a random sample of 17 time intervals between eruptions has a mean longer than 96 minutes? Well, that's pretty unlikely to happen. So what you might conclude is that the population um, is no longer 90, uh, 85 minutes. So so we've got the population mean must be less than 85 minutes. Well, it mu not must be, right? We don't want to use the word must because we're still just dealing with probability. So it's not going to be that one. The mean is 85, and this is an example of a typical sampling result. That's not the case because it's an unusual result. The population mean must be more than 85 minutes since the probability is low. And the word must is the problem here. We're headed in the right direction, but the key is we're dealing with probability, so it, it doesn't need to be more than 85 minutes, but it probably is. The mean is probably less than 85 minutes. Well, that's not really true because we think it's more than that. Uh, the population mean cannot be 85 minutes. It's the probability so low. That's not true either, right? Once again, we're using definite answers, which you don't want to use with probability. The population mean cannot be, uh, wait, the population mean is 85 minutes, and this is just a rare sampling. Uh, that's possible um, that that one is true. The other option is the population mean is greater than 85. It could be that as well. Okay, so that's why there's two answers there. So both of those could be the case. And then the last one, suppose on a certain day, suppose that 26 time intervals for Old Faithful treating them these 26 eruptions as random sample, there's a 0.2 likelihood that the mean length of the time between eruptions will exceed what value? Okay, the likelihood of the mean length between eruptions exceeds blank minutes is 0 0.20. Okay, so this might be the problem that was uh, tripping up those of you who got partial credit because what this is asking us for is it's asking, giving us a probability and asking us for a time interval. And we know from um, the previous ch uh, chapter that the way we do those problems when we're given a value and we're asked to find uh, when we're given a probability and we're asked to find the data value that we want to use inverse CDF. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to put in 26 now for our sample size, right? So there's our graph. And then what we want to do, right, is we want to do inverse CDF, right, which we've talked about before. Now the question is what probability do we want to put in here? Well, what we know, uh, and let me actually switch over to my notebook paper here. So what we know is we've got a normal curve. We want the probability that it exceeds some x value to be 0.2, so we want this area to be 0.2. When we do inverse CDF, it does area to the left. So if there's 0.2 area to the right, how much area is over here? Well, that would be 0.8. So when we do inverse CDF here, we're going to want to use 0.8. And so what we get is we get a value of 88.5 minutes. So 88, a mean of 88.5 minutes or higher would have a probability of 0.2. Okay, so in these problems, we're doing a lot of the same things we did in Chapter 7. It's just a matter of including this square root symbol, right, because the means are changing. Uh, the bigger your sample size, the smaller the, the means aren't changing. Sorry, the standard deviations are changing. The bigger your sample size gets, the smaller the standard deviation gets because we take the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Okay, so that's the idea for uh, this section. So um, let's go ahead and uh, most of not all the problems in this section follow that same pattern. So let's just go ahead. Now that we've looked at one of those, let's go ahead and move on uh, to section 8.2. And if you have a question about any of these other problems, feel free to shoot me an email or a remind message. We can definitely talk about it. I'm just not going to include it in the video today. Okay. So for this one, uh, let's start down here at the bottom, uh, and we can look at these two because these appear to be the ones that you guys struggled on the most were the ones at the bottom. Um, 
So let's look at, uh, let's start with number nine. So this is number nine in the 8.3 homework. So number nine in the 18.3 uh, homework, it says, according to the study, the proportion of people who are satisfied with the way things are going in their lives is 0 0.86. Suppose that a random sample of 100 people is obtained. Complete parts A3. So suppose a random sample of 100 people are asked, are you satisfied with the way things are going in your life? Is the response to this question qualitative or quantitative? Okay. Now, this one might be one that tricked you guys up, um, but the key is, uh, your answers here are yes or no, right? Are you satisfied? So yes or no. So yes or no are we're classifying people. So that's um, because, so we're going to go with C, okay? Because we're classifying them. So we are counting the number of people that go into each one. Um, but... Uh, the key here is that the answers can be classified as either yes or no, so that's why it's qualitative. And a lot of times when we're doing um, proportions, the answer is qualitative, right? Because you're in one category or the other. When we talk about categories, we're talking about qualitative data. So explain why the sample proportion is a random variable. What is the source of variability? So the options are the sample proportion p hat is a random variable because the value of p hat represents a random person included in the sample. The variability is due to the fact that people may not be responding to the question truthfully. Uh, so that one's not quite right because uh, we're assuming they're answering truthfully. Um, and we're not actually talking about a single person with p hat, right? p hat is a uh, statistic. So therefore, we're talking about a sample. So the sample proportion p hat is a random variable because the value of p hat varies from sample to sample. The variability is due to the fact that people may not be responding to the question truthfully. Once again, it's not, this one's closer. This first part is definitely true, but the second part isn't true. It's not, we're not worried about them answering truthfully. The sample portion p hat is a random variable because the value of p hat represents a random person. Once again, it doesn't represent a random person, so it's not going to be C. And then D says the sample portion p hat is a random variable because the value of p hat varies with sample to sample, so that's good. The variability is due to the fact that different people feel differently regarding their satisfaction, right? That's what changes the variability. Depending on which people you sample, you will get a different result. Not because they're not telling the truth, but because different people have a different response. So depending on which people you sample, you'll get a different number of yes or no's. Describe the sampling distribution p hat, the proportion of people who are satisfied with the way things are going in their life. Be sure to verify the model requirements. So since the sample size is no more than 5%, right? 100 people is not going to be more than 5% uh, of the population. And the population, uh, n times p times 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10, so let's check that, okay? So in this case, n um, is 100, p is 0.86, and then we do 1 minus 0.86. So for this one, and right now it's giving me a fraction, which is not what I want. So let's get that as a decimal. So that's 12.04. So 12.04 is greater than or equal to 10. Because of those, uh, we could tell that p hat is going to be approximately normal with a mean of 0.86. And then we do the standard deviation. So the standard deviation is the square root of... 0.86 times 1 minus 0.86 divided by the sample size, so 100. So the standard deviation rounded to three decimal places is 0 0.035. Okay, so that's how you, we did that in the video lecture, right? That's how you check and make sure that you can do this. So once you do it, then it says in the sample obtained in part A, what is the probability that the proportion who are satisfied with the things way things are going uh, in their life exceeds 0 0.90. The probability that the proportion who are satisfied with the thing that is going exceeds this. So we know it's normal distribution, so we can do that. So normal distribution with a mean of 0.86 and a standard deviation of 0 0.035. So there it is. What, uh, they exceed that, right? So we want x to be bigger than 0.9. So 0.9 is less than that. And the probability of that is 
0 0.12, uh, rounding at four decimal places, so 6.5. Fantastic. Okay. So using the distribution from part C, would it be unusual for a survey of 100 people to reveal that 78 or fewer in the sample are satisfied with their lives? So the key here is, remember, when you're doing these is you need to put in proportions. So I want to know is x less than 78 divided by 100, right, because we're doing fewer. So if I do that, the probability is 0 0.0111 which is unusual because the probability is less than 5%. Okay, And the key is this had to be 5% and not 0 0.05 because it has this percent symbol right there. Okay, so let's go and look at one more of these. Uh, let's see, what's one more you guys really struggled with? Let's just go ahead and do um, problem number. Let's just go one problem this way and look at problem number eight and see how that goes. So exit polling is a popular technique used to determine the outcome of an election prior to results being tallied. So this is a nice uh, problem res related to uh, what, what's happening in America today. So suppose a referendum to increase funding for education is on the ballot in a large town. The voting population is over 100,000. An exit poll of 500 voters finds that 250 voted for the referendum. How likely are the results of your sample if the population proportion of voters in the town in favor of the referendum is 0 0.9? Based on the res your results, comment on the dangers of using exit polls to call elections. So how likely are the results of your sample if the population proportion of voters in the town in the referendum is 0.49? Okay. So let's go ahead and look at this. So start, this is... Um, we need to check, technically we need to check all the same things we checked before. Um, you want to take, is 500 less than 5% of 100,000? And it is. 5% of 100,000 would be 5,000, so we're under that number. Uh, and then is our uh, 5 times 0.49 times 1 minus 0.49, is that greater than or equal to 10 it is it's 124.95 so we're fine so now we can do the distribution so normal distribution our mean is 0.49 our standard deviation is the square root of 0.49 times 1 minus 0.49 all over 500 okay and we can try graphing this. Yep, there it is. Okay. So now we want to do, we want to find the probability of more than 250. So X needs to be bigger than 255. So the one thing you want to make sure you're doing here, right, is put in a proportion. So we want to find the probability of 255 out of 500. So that probability is 0, is 0 0.1. 855. Comment on the dangers of using exit polling. Choose the correct answer. So the result is not unusual because the probability that p hat is equal to or more extreme than the sample portion is greater than 5%. Thus, it is not unusual for a wrong call to be made in an election if exit polling alone is considered. And that, I believe, is the right answer. We could go through these other ones, but the key is the result is not unusual because it is greater than 5%. Um, and therefore, if you assumed that this p hat, which is uh, about, what is 225.5, that's like 51% of the population um, voted in favor, this is the problem with just using that. Uh, in fact, that's what you're going to learn about in Chapter 9, the upcoming chapter, is how do we deal with that range? Uh, and that's going to be what's called a confidence interval, which is what they actually use uh, to talk about elections. So in this case, um, point four, um, a majority, 0.49, would fall within the margin of error of the confidence interval, and therefore you wouldn't be able to call it based on this uh, confidence interval, uh, based on this. Okay. So um, at this point, let's go ahead and uh, call it uh, a day right there. This has been about a 
30 uh, some minute video. Like I said, if there were any questions on the homework that you had that uh, I didn't get to, feel free to send me a, a remind message or an email and I'll get back to you as soon as possible uh, to talk about that. Have a good one. Make sure you do the quiz um, that's due tomorrow night. Uh, and just as a reminder, uh, I'm coming down. You might notice the balloons in the back of the ground. As I've said before, I'm going on paternity leave uh, here um, the middle of next week. So I'll be with you guys for one more class period, hopefully on Tuesday, although with babies you never know, and we might uh, end up going earlier than that. Um, but I'm planning to be with you one more week next Tuesday, and then after that, uh, Mr. Tomchak is going to take over from me, uh, and I will have information posted in Blackboard how you can uh, visit his office hours or contact him if you have any questions.